Um, thank you for joining us today. At, um, we're here to deal with one of the greatest preventable tragedies in at least the Western Hemisphere. And uh, I'm so grateful that uh, Secretary General Almagro has been a strong voice for all of us in Washington to focus on the crisis, the tragic crisis that's unfolding in Venezuela. Such a remarkably talented people and country, extraordinary capacities, and it's just, uh, it's a breathtaking how tragic this has become. And fortunately, we've had voices, strong voices, like the Secretary General that has been willing to speak out for us. You know, it's hard for Americans to be outspoken about South America. We've got a fairly complex history, you know? Uh, and, but we can champion those that are willing to be a leader, and we're very proud that uh, he has been a leader for all of us. Um, I should just say, my name is John Hamry. I'm the president here. I'm, my only role is to welcome all of you, say thank you to our speakers, delighted that, that they are here. Uh, and to also say, uh, uh, Mike Matera, Michael Matera is responsible for your safety. If anything happens, please follow his instructions. The exits are right behind us, where we came in, and right over here. The, uh, we will go down, there's a stairway that goes down to the street level, take two left-hand turns. We'll go over, meet across at National Geographic of the Quarter. They have a great, great program on right now. I'll, we'll buy tickets for everybody if we have to get over there. But so please follow his instructions in case we need to do anything. Nothing's gonna happen, but please follow him if we need to. Uh, at this stage, uh, we have a limited amount of time for Secretary General Almagro, you know him. Uh, words of introduction aren't necessary for me for you to understand the importance of his voice with us today. So would you please, with your warm applause, welcome the Secretary General for the Amer Organization of American States, Secretary General Elmhurst. Thank, Regime, like Cuba in the wake of Fidel Castro's death, Nicaragua with the Somoza family, etc. An internal coup d'etat against the dictator, we can, we know, which opens the possibility of a democratic transition. Third, an internal armed insurrection against the dictatorship that can open the way to fair elections. A foreign military intervention, like happened in uh, Panama and the murder of the dictator. All of these uh, don't look so politically correct, but uh, <clears throat> given today realities, it is difficult to see how Venezuela can get out of this dictatorship. It is very difficult to think that could be in good terms a democratic way to democracy or a peaceful way to peace. Instead, we need a bold action to fashion a new way to end the 21st century nar narco dictatorship that is Venezuela and to make it return to democratic order. To rescue Venezuela democracy, to save the Venezuelan people from the daily humanitarian devastation they face, to preserve tranquility in Venezuela's neighbors, which are increasingly under refugee pressure, requires bold and coordinated international action. International action short of foreign military intervention, maybe, but action that radically increases the pressure on the Maduro regime and its core supporters and allies. That pressure must come from a variety of sources, both external and internal, political and economic. As we act, we must be clear-eyed about the realities facing the Venezuelan people. Because make no mistake, the Venezuelan people are under siege. They are subject to repression, wrongful imprisonment, torture, and starvation at the hands of a corrupt, abusive, illegal regime. The average of Venezuela has lost near 
The average Venezuelan has lost nearly 20 pounds during the past year under the effects of a crashing humanitarian disaster brought by corruption, incompetence, and design. An infant born in Syria today has a better chance of survival than one born in Venezuela. This is outrageous. There are those who caution against sectoral sanctions for fear of inflicting greater suffering upon the Venezuelan people. But they do not understand that the Venezuelan people are already being sanctioned and worse by the Maduro regime. Sanctioning Venezuela oil sector, for example, will not deprive the Venezuelan people of the social benefit of the revenues generated by the country's vast natural resources. The Maduro regime has already done that. In fact, the international community has an obligation to sanction sectors the regime plunders for the resources fueling its systemic repression. I do not make this call lightly, and nor should governments across the Americas and around the world take this matter lightly. But bold action is needed to rescue Venezuela's democracy. What is more, the regime itself has told us what it most fears are sanctions. Why else place the removal of existing United States sanctions at the top of its agenda in its recent fake talks with portions of the Venezuelan opposition? Adding sectoral sanctions does not mean abandoning individualized targeted sanctions. Far from it. Those must be expanded to include the oppressor's families. No one related to Nicolás Maduro and those around him should freely enter any other country in the hemisphere, or for that matter, the world. Neither should those handling the scoundrels illicit finances. The only way these individuals should enter the United States, for example, should be to face justice in a New York or Houston courtroom. International action cannot stop at sanctions. Bringing Maduro and others responsible for crimes against humanity before international justice is another way to build pressure. To that end, I welcome the International Criminal Court's Chief Prosecutor's recent announcement opening an investigation into actions in Venezuela. In the coming days, the expert panel of international jurists that we convene at the OES to take testimony from those affected by the regime's illegal actions will issue its recommendations regarding whether and against whom it recommended that cases were brought for crimes against humanity before the ICC. It is my sincere desire that the report be used by an ACC member state as to open formal cases before the court. On the diplomatic front, I celebrate Peru's decision to disinvite Nicolás Maduro from the Summit of the Americas. The action underscores Venezuela's growing diplomatic isolation. In short, the international community must be relentless in attempting to fracture the Maduro regime through pressure, and we should take solace that the regime is fracturing. Maduro scrambled to hold completely illegitimate elections as early as possible this year, demonstrate his weakened position. A confident dictator does not hold sham elections before their time, nor does a confident dictator work tirelessly to co-opt sectors of the opposition. International pressure is essential, but insufficient. Internal pressure must be part of the equation. A presence galvanized by unified and coherent call for action by those sufferings at the hands of the regime with a clear vision of a better tomorrow in Venezuela. There too, the international community has an important role. We must articulate in unmistakable terms that we will do to what we will do to support Venezuela tomorrow. Beyond the sticks of increased sanctions and political pressure, the international community must provide to the Venezuelan people, all the Venezuelan people. We must also send a clear signal to those within the regime that a post-Maduro future exists so long as that future begins with an unmistakable step towards returning power to its only rightful owner, the Venezuelan people. Undoing Venezuela economic and humanitarian catastrophe will be a generational undertaking one that will be able to draw from the remarkable talent of the massive Venezuela diaspora created in recent years. 
but it will also need significant, immediate, and sustained international support and humanitarian assistance. It will require support to rebuild the most basic institutions of governance and democratic expression. As Secretary General of the Organization of American States, I can say without hesitation that the General Secretariat is ready to play its role in both crafting the aid and executing it when the time comes. Our mission is clear, it's seemingly daunting at this hour, increase pressure on the Maduro regime while simultaneously and concretely preparing for the day it falls. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General Almagro. Um, the Secretary General is having to leave. Uh, there was a, a permanent council meeting called uh, just this morning, so he uh, excuses himself. Um, really, more than any other uh, global leader or individual, uh, Luis Almagro has been tireless in his efforts in, in defense of democracy in Venezuela and deserves all of our thanks. But thank you again, um, Luis, for coming. Thank you. So an important part of the international community's efforts to push uh, the crisis in Venezuela uh, to a conclusion has been a concerted effort by former presidents of the region uh, to draw public attention to the crisis. Uh, the IDEA group of former presidents has been the most active among, among these groups. This group includes presidents Prostrana of Colombia, Chinchilla of Costa Rica, Asnar and Gonzalez of, of Spain, Former President uh, Jorge Quiroga of Bolivia has been one of the most outspoken members of this distinguished group. Uh, president Quiroga joins us today and will share some of his own insights. Um, the president has uh, strong links with his country. He's been married to an American and as a graduate of Texas A&M a number of years ago. But uh, great to have you back here, President Quiroga. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael, Moises, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, good morning, Maria Corina. Buen día. ¿Estás escuchando? See, ah, bien, bien. Mi heroína Maria Corina. There she is on the on the screen. Uh, thanks to the CSIS for organizing this. 2018 is a critical year. Um, we have a soccer World Cup, so you may have your favorites. Uh, all the powerhouses are staying away this time. Italy, Netherlands, Bolivia. We decided to let all the teams go this year, so we'll be watching it on TV. Uh, but it, when it comes to politics, democracy, uh, trust me, it is a very critical year, 2018. I know in places like this, uh, Michael, CSIS, there's a lot of discussion on the North Korean rogue regime and ICBMs. Well, every 12 years in Latin America, you got to have your ICBM. Keep your eye out for CBM, Colombia, Brazil, Mexico. Every 12 years, the elections coincide. And if something is Latin America, it is Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, more than half of our people in Latin America, over two thirds of our economy, and they have um, elections this year. But I would submit to you that in 2018, we will see something that has never been seen before, is the CBM, the CVCBM. Cuba, Venezuela first in April, then Colombia, Brazil, Mexico. So that makes it for a very packed year. Uh, in, in 2018. And let me focus on particularly uh, the Cuba, Venezuela, things that are going to be happening in April. The next 58 days from now, Maduro, the narco tyrant that governs Venezuela, has announced that he is installing the second full out, full blown Cuba in Latin America in the year 2018. 58 days from now. The last 10 days of those 58 are critical. We will have the Summit of the Americas that is supposed to uphold democracy, liberty, human rights in Lima, April 13th, 14th. On, 19th, on the 19th of April, uh, the Castros will be theoretically gone and pass on power to someone, Diaz Canelo, whoever it is. And then on April 22nd, and it's no coincidence, the dates have been set up that way, Maduro says he's going for everything. The presidency, the regional assemblies, the city council, the country, as if they hadn't done enough damage already over the last 18 years, they are going to install the second Cuba. So it is a critical uh, time for all of us, and I would submit to you that ground zero for this struggle is Venezuela. Nowhere else is the struggle of liberty against tyranny, of uh, freedom, 
against autocrats, uh, democracy versus a ruthless dictatorship. Nowhere else is that crystallized as clearly as the struggle in Venezuela. Uh, you, all, you all know the, the figures, the facts and the figures, but nowhere else have we seen a country so richly endowed being so profoundly destroyed by a regime over the course of 18 years with the best oil prices ever. And they have managed to create an economic debacle, a humanitarian catastrophe, massive political rep repression, and to destroy democracy over this short period of time. I think you, you can paraphrase Churchill in reverse. You know, the, famous phase, uh, the famous phrase or the quote by Churchill is that never have uh, so much owed so many to so few on the defense against the Nazi Air Force. Well, with Maduro is kind of the reverse of that. Never in Latin American history has a regime with so much power, with so much time to enjoy that power, with so much money, destroyed so much of its economy, impoverished so many of its people for the benefit of a few kleptocratic criminals that govern that country. Never. You will never find a case like that. Just look at the, uh, quickly, the economic debacle. Uh, you, will never get, you will never find a country that is a petrol power mired in hyperinflation and with the, econo with the economy contracting rapidly. By this year, Maduro will have the Venezuelan economy be half the size of what it was when he took over. And if you add the Chavez and Maduro regimes, it will be smaller than when they started with the best oil prices ever. Let me tell you, that takes black magic. It's a miracle. It's Midas in reverse. It's taking gold and turning it into, into dust. And you all know the figures on, uh, on inflation, on devaluation. Um, the, the last time I was in Venezuela, before they declared uh, mi persona non grata, uh, they just did it verbally. I'm asking for it in writing, because I want to put it up on, on my wall. Um, <laughs> the, um, the largest bill was 100 bolivares fuertes. Talk about a monetary oxymoron. Poor liberator. Bolivares fuertes. Now they had to add a bill that's 100,000. Imagine if the largest paper bill in this country went from 100 to 100,000. That, that is the level of destruction, hyperinflation that, that you find. And that is all over the place. If you look, uh, if you, some of you have read uh, Moises Naim's, not the last book, the, the one that publicized by Facebook, but the one before, Illicit, that talks about all the forms that you can make money with human tra trafficking, smuggling goods, is the navigation manual for the regime. Every crime that you can commit and profit it from drugs and arms and, and everything else they have, they have done and they are, they've carried it forward. And they've wasted all the money. They spent the 18 years, they, they stole the last 18 years of the best income that Venezuela's ever had. They're stealing all the savings, all the gold, the SDRs at the IMF, um, all the reserves that they had. And now they want to steal the future by issuing hunger bonds of 21 cents and the dollars with this petrol thing and the getting prepaid uh, the debts that they were owed by other countries. They have totally wiped out the economy. On the humanitarian side, imagine being a Venezuelan mother. You have to queue, getting queues for long hours the, on the day of the week that your ID lets you do that. While you're sitting in line, hyperinflation eats away the money you have in your purse. When you get to the store, there's nothing to buy. When you walk out, the criminals steal everything that you could possibly have gotten. When you get home and a petrol power, you've got to cook with wood. Your children, your nephews, your relatives are dying of malaria, diphtheria. They're losing weight. They have no education to speak of. Uh, and it's, if, if when somebody dies, you've got to bury them in a cardboard casket because they don't even have caskets. That is the hard. Uh, reality that Venezuelans are facing on the most richly endowed country in the history of the world. The last Encovi work that came out, the survey of households, shows that Maduro has truly accomplished something unique in five years. He has doubled poverty and he's tripled extreme poverty on, a, on an oil petrol power. Uh, and that leads to the political uh, blackmail that they use. I mean, I don't want to dwell into technical details, but there's two ways of measuring poverty. Unsatisfied basic needs, housing, health, education, services, or income. The dollar a day, dollar twenty-five a day. What they have done is they have destroyed all the services that the government can provide vis-a-vis -vis education, health, and what have you, so they've taken that away. And with hyperinflation, mismanagement, expropriation, confiscation, they wiped out the income. So the only way you can eat you can eat. It's through the blackmail of the claps and, and the bolsas that are given away. 
So long as you keep voting for the regime and let them stay entrenched in power, that is truly creative. Destroy the means of services, of, of, of social services, take away the income, and then if you want to eat, you got to keep, you got to let me stay in power. And you got to get the carnet de la patria, and you got to get the bolsa clap, and as soon when you walk out, you may get a little bit of food if you're hungry. Coupled with that economic debacle, humanitarian catastrophe, ruthless re repression, if you think of democracy, what do you need in democracy? Independent institutions, opposition, free press. Uh, they have taken that and they've gone, okay, judges, a puny, put her in jail, rape her, not metaphorically, for real, and they have, they have subjugated all the independent institutions. Opposition, mayors, governors, congressmen, young people that the tweet, they get put in la tumba, uh, massive repression, and we have witnessed in, in this year something that we hadn't seen. A policeman, Oscar Perez, that rebels against the government, he's RPG to death and summarily executed on the almost live uh, social media transmission. I mean, that is, I understand the uproar that it, that you, that it causes, and justifiably so, when you see a, sh a wild, crazy shooter go into a school and kill 17 kids. Well, here you had a state-sanctioned execution with military RPGs and a shot to the head of all the police that had uh, rebelled against the government. That is the nature, the criminal nature of this uh, regime. And um, I I'll close with the following. They have unleashed this slow-motion coup that is about to be finalized. The opposition, Maria Corina, we were all there in December 2015. The opposition won the Congress with two-thirds. You know the legislative mechanics of any country. With two-thirds of Congress, you can even change the gender of angels. It's, it's, it's very powerful to have that. Well, the, the government then unleashed the slow motion coup. The judicial seizure over Christmas 2015 to castrate the Congress. It could not legislate, it could not appropriate resources, it could not, do, it could not, could not approve the gravity law. Everything was, uh, was disbarred for the Congress. Then they canceled the revocatorio, where Maduro was going to lose power. Then they installed the Asamblea Nacional Constituyente, ANC. I prefer to call it the Asamblea Narco-Cubana. They put it in place uh, in July after a massive uh, popular mobilization on July 16th. It w I was there, I'm, and I'm sad to say that Everybody that we saw with Maria Corina there has been harassed or exiled or persecuted, including Enrique Aristegueta, uh, that we saw that. It was a massive exercise, and the response by the government, knowing fully well on July 16th that they had lost the popular support, was to decide never again to have free and fair elections, and every election since then has not been an election, it's been a coronation, a fraudulent, massive coronation. July 30th, the Asamblea Narco-Cubana, then in October, the regional elections, then in December, the municipal elections, with the uh, displacing voters, stealing outright, uh, rigging the election in Bolivar to, to the governor. I mean, every trick in the book they, they have deployed and they've used, and they, they will never again have free and fair elections. Uh, with that, let me, um, Michael, close with a suggestion of what Secretary Almagro said is important. I've never s been so happy to see him leave, by the way. Uh, he's going to the Permanent Council. It was about time to bring it back to the OAS. I appreciate the work that other, other countries are doing, but it has to be, be put back into the OAS. And this is the first step. The resolution that is about to be discussed is not what I would have drafted, but it's, the important thing is the ball is coming back to the court of Almagro, who's been the champion in the defense of democracy and liberty. I'll close with the following, and I'll ask Moises here to, to help me out. You, you write this, and then you send it to me. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give you the eight things that the international community should be doing. Between now and April 22nd, the next 58 days, is toda la carne al asador, as we would say in Latin America. Everything has to be put on the table. Uh, first, C, the charter. The OES Democratic Charter has been invoked by Almagro. It is on the table. There is a resolution that will be voted. And if they are not going to be invited, they, the regime, be invited to Lima, we should apply the full weight of Article 20 and the Democratic Charter, and we need the 23 votes, and we need two-thirds to fully apply it now between now and April 22nd. See the Charter. S, sanctions. Sanctioning what Almagro said, the crooks, the relatives, the testaferros, the frontmen, and every, everybody else that is involved with the regime. I, ICC, the referral to the International Criminal Court of The Hague. Almagro will finish their work, it'll be referred. We need a state to step up to the plate and do the accusation so they can be persecuted and tried, and so the people in the regime know in their future it is a hot amaca in Cuba or a cold cell at The Hague.
that that is in, in their future. So the ICC referral has to be done. Uh, S, seizures. Not only sanction the people, but we know where these crooks and their relatives have their bank accounts, their beautiful homes in Miami, Madrid, in Panama, in Colombia, seize the assets. Would you like to, in Washington, be a neighbor of Mugabe's relatives? Would you like to, in Bethesda, be a relative of uh, Obiang and his relatives? You wouldn't want to. You would demand that justice be done, that those assets be seized, and be given back to the people that, that it was stolen from. Uh, M, migration. If there is one country that needs a massive, comprehensive, TPS-like migration program put in place all over the Americas and Europe is Venezuela. The refugee crisis in Venezuela is larger uh, in terms of number of people that are fleeing than Syria or the Rohingyas in Myanmar. The advantage is they're not all coming to Miami. They're going to Madrid, they're going to Colombia. The staging grounds are Colombia, Brazil, and we need to have IDB, World Bank money, help those people get absorbed, be relocated to countries like in Peru. If there if are children that are migrating with families, they're in seventh grade, let them get into eighth grade in Peru, Buenos Aires, wherever they're going, recognize their university degrees, do a comprehensive migration help. And I know that if you say TPS in this town right now, it sounds bad. We're not talking Honduras. We're not talking Salvador, everybody fleeing to Miami. No, worldwide. And I think that's sensible. And, I, and trust me, if somebody has the clout in Florida as a voting bloc, to have the U.S. participate in a global migration refugee uh, package. It is the Venezuelan community and the diaspora in, in Florida. O, uh, oil. Um, uh, Almagro's mentioned it, and I know what it, it creates the following reaction. Oh my God, we're going to give them an excuse uh, and we're going to starve the poor people. There is no more pain that can be inflicted on the Venezuelan people than the Maduro regime. They have done an embargo on the Venezuelan people. They have stolen the country blind, and all the oil money is in Andorra, in Panama, and their bank accounts. If something should be done with the oil, is give it back to the people of Venezuela. They have a Congress. In any democracy, Congress budgets, appropriates, and uses the resources, except in Venezuela, where they steal a country blind. At least we had to consider having the oil funds that come to Venezuela be put in an escrow account only to be disbursed for food, for medicine, for all the things that are being stolen while they take the money to Andorra under approval of the Congress before they try to close it down. But uh, oil ought to be looked at in that way. Uh, D, diplomatic relations. I salute the countries that are saying that they will not recognize the uh, fraudulent process put in place for April 22nd. I would only suggest do it now. If a credible threat is about to be carried out, do not wait. If I was in Colombia with Moises in the 80s and Popeye and Pablo Escobar Sicarios were to publicly announce, we are going to kill Moises Rendon on April 22nd, I don't think I'd be a good friend if I say, don't worry, Moises. The day after, I'll take him to the police. I'll denounce it to the police. No, it's a credible threat. Act now. If you're going to pull out your ambassador, do it now. The next 58 days, all the pressure has to be applied. And not wait for a very credible threat of a ruthless regime to carry it out. Uh, the last E is expulsions. Uh, all these peoples and the seizures, the assets, the cronies, the families, uh, they should be taken out of countries. And like Mercosur kicked them out, UNASUR ought to kick them out or get disbanded. All the pressure that can be put to bear has to be brought over the next 58 days. Do not wait. It's, do not wait and say, oh, I'll do something next year. It may be too late. So if you run down those eight things, the charter, the sanctions, the ICC, the seizures, the migration, the oil, the diplomatic relations expulsion, Read the first letter vertically, it's CSIS mode. So let's get on CSIS, CSIS mode for the international community. Uh, I'll close with the following. I know that some people lose hope and they say, no, no, the Venezuelan political leadership, this and that, and they've given up and, and what have you. Trust me, the Venezuelan people have done more that can be asked of them to struggle against them. We were there in July. We saw, and Maria Corina had uh, brought the parents of Neomar Lander, Vallenilla, Pernalete, all these young hero, heroic kids, 17, 18, with a helmet, with a tear gas mask, with a t-shirt that said, Yo soy libertador, like Michael Jackson, glove in one hand, to return the tear gas canisters and protect the older people that were marching. They are truly heroic people, and they deserve all the help, and they're not giving up, because the one thing that always will stay with me is on July 15th, we were talking to the parents. 
and you think they must be destroyed, they must be about ready to give up. And Neomar Lander's uh, mother, Sugeymar, says, my son's sacrifice will be worth something. Because he sacrificed so this girl, Paulita Lander, sitting next to her, 13-year-old beautiful girl, can live in, a free uh, live, in, live in a free Venezuela. Trust me, they are going to stay at it. They deserve all the help they can give you. And one of my heroes is on the screen. We'll be hearing from her. They deserve all the help. Stay at it. Keep going. Mi heroina Maria Corina. And let's have a, 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 a close up the phone. How many people here from Venezuela? Raise your hands. OK. I was uh, July 16. Maria Corina knows this. I'm, I'm kind of. A little, I, I take, I take um, perhaps more risks than I should. I went to Katia, El Paraíso, Los Verdes, the Chavista strongholds in Caracas, the day of July 16th, and places where they would call me names in 2007 when I went. And in 2016, in Chavista strongholds, they all want democracy, they all want freedom. And I could hear the people, the voice, there's two questions that, are always, that were asked recurrently with a growing crescendo, and the people would start answering. The questions were, ¿Quiénes somos? And people start going, Venezuela. ¿Qué queremos? Libertad. Who are we? Venezuela. What do we want? Freedom. Let me tell you, between now and April 22nd, please, we're all Venezuela. We all want freedom, and let's help that country be saved. Thank you. No. President Quiroga, thank you. thank you very much. Um, I remind everyone that this is the second time that we've had Jorge here at CSIS, and it won't be the last. Uh, we've now had the Uruguayan Secretary General of the OAS. We've had the former president of Bolivia. It's now time to turn the floor over to the Venezuelans. Um, the, the person here at CSIS who has led our efforts over these last two years in, in uh, explaining and understanding how the, uh, the Venezuelan crisis has developed, how we've gotten to where we are today, is Moises Rendon. Uh, Moises is a, an associate director of the Americas program. Um, he was hired on my first day on the job, and he's done a fantastic job. Uh, he could take over my job uh, very easily tomorrow. <laughs> but um, no, uh, one of his most important contributions and, and that of our team, including a distinguished senior advisor, Mark Schneider, uh, who's here in the, in the audience, has been to put, to put together a matrix of actions and reforms that will be required once the situation in Venezuela allows its own people and the international community to begin rebuilding the country's political, economic, and social structure. M Mark Schneider and Moises just returned a couple of days ago uh, from a visit to the Colombian-Venezuelan border at Cucuta. Uh, where they went to take measure of the refugee crisis uh, along that border and along the borders with uh, Venezuela's borders with uh, Brazil and Guyana. Moises is going to be leading the rest of the discussion, introducing Maria Corina Machado, who is with us uh, for a second time, uh, who has been one of the bravest uh, opposition leaders in Venezuela and, mo and one of the most outspoken uh, critics of the Maduro dictatorship, or narco dictatorship, as the Secretary General called it uh, a few minutes ago. Moises, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, everybody, for being here at CSAS. And Thank you, Ms. Machado, for joining us today at CSIS. Last time we have you, we hope to host you in person. But unfortunately, you're still banned to leave the country due to the continued repression of the Maduro regime. However, we want to let you know that you have an open invitation to come to CSIS in person in the future. So we look forward for that soon. Maria Corina Machado was elected member of the National Assembly of Venezuela in September 2010 and um, being one of the most voted candidates in the race. And as a congressman, she was a firm and um, vocal critic of the regime. Mrs. Machado ran as an independent presidential candidate during the opposition primaries held on February 2012. And she's also the leader of the political party Vente Venezuela. Thank you again, Mrs. Machado. It's very valuable to have your voice here in Washington. We all look forward to for your thoughts. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Moises, Michael, Tuto. It's an honor, a pleasure to share with you this opportunity and CSIS once again to, to let me convey from the ground some insight of what we are actually facing in this truly very dangerous situation. I, I believe it, it has come clear to all in Venezuela and around the world that uh, uh, an electoral route for restoring democracy in Venezuela is no longer possible. The regime has 
certainly closed it. Um, and these sham elections of, uh, in April 22nd, it's, uh, it's a clear evidence that uh, Maduro certainly uh, despises um, popular sovereignty and is willing to accelerate this process as, as fast as, as they can. Nevertheless, I believe there is uh, a true, a real, but short window of opportunity to have a transition to democracy, which I insist is no other than regime change. Uh, before I go further into this, I, I'd like to brief, briefly bring into attention uh, three key elements that are happening right now in Venezuela that I believe are accelerating this already tense and volatile situation. Um, one is uh, the already deplorable levels of hunger uh, that we, 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 we've seen in images around the world and that certainly uh, this new survey that, uh, that just came out two days ago, the COVID survey that you've mentioned, uh, give you know, hard and crude and cold numbers to, to an explanation to what's happening uh, with this huge exodus to neighboring countries. Uh, but this situation is certainly going to worsen uh, dramatically uh, as days go by. I just want to let you know what uh, an information that uh, the Federation of Agricultural Productions have just uh, bring out regarding the local uh, production of, um, uh, of food that uh, will happen in Venezuela this year. Historically, we used to produce around 70% of what uh, the domestic uh, demand. Last year, it had already decreased to around 35%. Uh, given the lack of seeds, transportation, fertilizers, and so on, uh, they expect that in the best scenario possible, this will not uh, surpass or uh, increase or be over 12% of uh, the total demand. That means at least 88% of what is basically needed to, to feed 30 million Venezuelans will have to come from imports. But, and that's the second key element, is that uh, in terms of cash flow, the regime is absolutely broken, not only because of intentional uh, corruption and, and, and de de deplorable um, management of PDVSA and, and other um, sources of income, but because sanctions have been working. Uh, regarding oil production, uh, I, I have recent information that comes from uh, contractors and um, workers of, uh, of the oil company that uh, project uh, uh, an, an oil output that is significantly lower than the already uh, alarmant um, uh, figures that the International Energy Agency uh, is um, reporting. And, and the information I've, I've, I've received recently is um, a production around 1.3 billion uh, barrels uh, per day. So that means there's no more money. Um, and, and the third uh, key element that I, I want to put into place is the how the criminal networks continue to advance their stronghold over the, the national territory. The alarming expansion of the Colombian armed revolutionary uh, forces, as well in, in a lesser manner, the uh, ELN, uh, that already have taken over and have influence of over 40% of Venezuelan territory. And that, that's increasing by, uh, by the hour, as well as they are taking over uh, very highly, um, uh, um, let's say, beneficiary um, illicit in industries such as uh, extraction and, com and commercialization of uh, uh, gold, coltan, diamonds, and so on. So this is um, uh, an, an, an element that we, we need to have into account to understand the um, the importance that Venezuela has in a uh, transnational project that is uh, decided to expand and that is using uh, Venezuela as a sanctuary as well as an as a source for very lucrative activities. 
Um, the obvious takeaway from, from this dark picture is that regime has no incentives whatsoever uh, to live in power. So um, it, it has decided to further, uh, uh, the dictatorship further entrenches and isolates itself. That is why they need these sham elections uh, in a very short term uh, and in the description, in the terms and conditions Tuto Quiroga just described. Um, at the beginning, I referred to a short but real window of opportunity, and I, I do so because I believe the five, the five, there were five pillars on which the Maduro regime has been um, standing that they used to support it. One is, of course, very uh, ample uh, financial resources. Second, the legitimacy that comes from uh, the, the right from support of the people, either real or, or perceived. Third, the support of the international community through silence, tolerance, and even in some cases, uh, outright complicity. For the mafia system and, and the criminal activities, and, and finally, the armed forces. I believe today, three of these pillars have been already eroded, thanks to the heroic struggle of the Venezuelan people here and abroad, and of course, uh, the assertive and coordinated effort of the international community. First, um, the financial support the region uh, used to have, well, we'll know it's, it's, I mentioned it before, it's had already run out of, of cash flow. Second, uh, regarding the, the popular support today, more than 90% of the Venezuelan people simply repudiate Maduro regimes. And third, the international support that the, the regime had before uh, and it has eroded, as I said, in the last uh, past years uh, since the arrival of a visionary leader such as Luis Almagro to the OAS Secretary uh, General Office, as well as uh, courageous voices such as the uh, IDEA, former presidents, uh, member of parliaments, journalists, and more recently, foreign ministers and presidents and, and the Grupo de Lima. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, this you know, this concerted effort of action and, and support to the Venezuelan people has resulted in, in the position of these sanctions and the support uh, already of 52 countries uh, throughout uh, the world, worldwide. So this, this proven and effective international pressure is now crucial for advancing in fracturing the two remaining pillars that still support this regime. And um, I'm talking about first, of course, of the mafia system and, and the cartels and, and the criminal enterprises. And second, the remaining part of the military, the armed forces that, that still um, supports the regime. So, you know, what, what to do then? And uh, uh, very important advances have, have been made recently uh, and uh, I want to mention certainly in first hand the, the individual and financial sanctions that have imposed upon uh, human rights violators and corrupt government officials, freezing of assets, increased compliance oversight of illicit trans transactions, apprehension and extradition of drug traffickers such as the um, Celia Flores nephews, um, and, and uh, the, the, the fact that this teaming pressure uh, the steam from these uh, measures have caused uh, high-profile defections among uh, networks of complicity. Uh, the most notoriously, uh, former uh, prosecutor, general prosecutor Luis Ortega Diaz, uh, and recently um, Rafael Ramirez, who used to be the most powerful person in Venezuela over a decade. Um, the reaction of the regime has to imprison over 80 uh, workers of PDVSA linked to Ramirez. Uh, but the fact is that um, the pressure inside the company has been increasing, as well as the fear. And now we have information of over 5,000 uh, Venezuela PDVSA workers who have resigned or simply abandoned uh, their positions. Um, regarding the armed forces, uh, there is also clear evidence of growing internal Thrive within the change of command, owing to national and international pressure. At least 137 officials are 
in prison. They are being accused of treason to the country uh, uh, or uh, because they had reflu refused to comply with orders to, to repress. Uh, uh, right now, uh, over 1,200 officers uh, we, we have been reported that have asked to, to, to be discharged of their positions. They want, they want to leave. And, uh, and this is, does not take into account uh, hundreds or even thousands of uh, soldiers. Um, you know, so, so what, what, what did we miss in the past? Why, after four months of popular rebellion, uh, that the whole world watch and follow so closely, didn't we uh, actually were able to move ahead into uh, a transition to democracy. And, and unfortunately, we have to say we, we did come very close uh, to bring the armed forces to stand beside the Venezuelan people. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I believe uh, political leadership uh, lack cohesion, follow through and let's say courage to, to move ahead in a popular mandate that was given by 7.6 million Venezuelans on the popular plebiscite of um, July 16. Armed forces, servicemen and women must decidedly stand beside the Venezuelan people and disobey treasonous orders such as supporting the sham elections on April 22nd. So finally, what else? What else can and should be done? And I'll start saying that the only way to erode these remaining pillars of power, therefore restoring Venezuelan democracy, is through the continued increase of coordinated internal and external pressure. Focus on raising the cost of the ruling clique's per permanence in power and lowering the cost of exits. The following are just some initiatives that could and should be taken shortly. First, sanctions have worked because they have been carefully designed to chuck off sources of financing and, so, and opportunities for laundering corruption money through front men. For further target, targeted uh, sanctions, travel restrictions, and freezing of assets must be pursued throughout the Latin American region, and especially our neighboring countries so that corrupt regime officials find no safe heaven for their stolen fortunes and family members. Second, at the same time, guarantees must be established for those civilian and military re regime officials willing to facilitate a transition to democracy. Third, external actors that support the regime through geopolitical and economic interests such as Russia and China and some Caribbean nations must be persuaded and incentivized to side with Venezuelan democracy through the understanding that they, they stand to gain more from their investments once a transition has been carried out. On the other hand, irregular actors such as drug cartels, guerrilla, Hezbollah, and Cuban agents must and should be neutralized. Finally, I believe the vast sums of seized assets should be immediately uh, transferred to a national fund for the reconstruction of our nation, of Venezuela. Um, you know, these external pressures, as I said before, will only be effective if they are complemented by and met with a firm and decisive political stewardship here in Venezuela. To that end, the talents of Venezuelan citizens of all walks of life, of all sectors, have been coming together in a new platform, a civilian platform, uh, an ethical coalition with a clear uh, objective, which is to achieve democratic transition. And that, and by that I mean re regime change in the shortest time possible. That platform is called Soy Venezuela, and its uh, members are not only Venezuelans that are working and struggling and fighting in our territory, but are wonderful, extraordinary diaspora throughout the world. 
Once democracy is restored in Venezuela, we will embark upon what is probably the most complex experience of nation rebuilding in our hemisphere history. Given the convergence of three critical, cri uh, three uh, profound crises, humanitarian crisis, an internal security crisis, and an economic crisis, fighting at the same time to dismantle a system of mafia system, which will be fighting to have this transition fail. So it is in the utmost security interests of the international community to aid in the implementation of deep reforms which will restore the institutions that support, that support a free market and attract much needed foreign investment. I have deep confidence in the Venezuelan people's talent, creative spirit and strength to carry out this arduous recovery which will lead to prosperity. But no one, no one can underestimate the level of destruction that 20 years of authoritarian rule have left behind. Venezuela recovery will require massive financial assistance. Some estimates are even uh, larger than $60 billion. Investment in social programs, as well as technical humanitarian relief and security expertise. Today, I speak before you in the knowledge that never before, never before has this hemisphere seen the convergence of so many dark and evil transactional interests bent on the destruction of the lives of futures of a nation like what we are now witnessing in, in Venezuela. But with, with the same conviction, I can also assure you that never before has this hemisphere seen the concerted and formidable effort of so many countries coming together with the people of Venezuela here and around the world to restore democracy, freedom, peace and prosperity in a country. And for these and on behalf of all the Venezuelan people, I truly thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Machado, for your encouraging presentation. We were recently in Cucut, and I, this is the point that I want to uh, you to emphasize a little bit. I actually have two questions. So, um, we were recently in Cucuta, Colombia, and I, we saw with our own eyes the desperation of the people crossing the border. And this is for all of you. I mean, this is the most, the most popular crossing point between the two countries. Um, one senior official um, told us that 91,000 people cross only in one day, uh, just two days before we arrived to Cúcuta. So we're seeing a massive refugee crisis going on that is only going to get worse. However, I do not see, being here in Washington, I don't see the international community as aware. I mean, the, the international community is always some months behind what's going on on the ground in Venezuela. So, Mrs. Machado, we're seeing a regime starving its own people. This is a crime against humanity by itself. Um, so in your, in your opinion, what specific actions uh, should the international community take to help alleviate the suffering of the, of the Venezuelan people at the border with Brazil, Colombia, but also in other ways that you have? Any thoughts on how can we help to alleviate the, the humanitarian disaster in Venezuela. Thank you. Thank you, Moises. Well, my, my first reaction is the only way to al alleviate pain in Venezuela is to have uh, the re regime change. And that's something that should not be done in the short term and can be done. Second, certainly we, we advise and alert uh, a long time ago of a humanitarian crisis. No one thought this would come. What we're saying now, this is going to be a catastrophe. And actually, we warned some um, diplomatic um, people of neighboring countries of the necessity to be thinking of the creation of refugee camps 
uh, a long time ago, and 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 that was seen as something that you know wouldn't ever happen. So uh, that is something that should be uh, uh, discussed and approved immediately. Uh, there, this um, specifically Colombia uh, is requiring huge amount of resources to create these um, refugee camps, and I would say we we need uh, Venezuelan people to know that this uh, support is ready and willing to come immediately into the country and make that the scene. And there are different ways uh, in order to do that. For the Venezuelan people to know that food and medicine is there, willing to come in in order to alleviate this problem and the, and the government is not letting this uh, aid to, to be facilitated. Thank you. And now I want to put uh, President Quiroga and you, Mrs. Machado, on the same question. And you mentioned the diaspora. You mentioned that uh, Soy Venezuela is a platform right now, not only for Venezuelans, but also for the, the people living abroad. And um, President Quiroga, you are a former president of a country, and you know the, the powerful and the, the tools that the diaspora can, can use from abroad. So what else can the Venezuelan diaspora do to help alleviate the situation and, and to combat the regime in, in, in a way, in an effective way. What else can we all do from abroad? If you don't mind starting, Mr. Machado, we're, we're Me? all, yeah, sure. Well, I, I would start saying many things that are still, that, that they have been doing for years. We wouldn't be here if we hadn't had the voices, courageous voices of Venezuela that are going through really really hard times uh, in, in this imposed exilium. So uh, that, that is speaking out, uh, pressuring governments and parliaments, uh, organizing uh, what we've seen in the last months uh, in terms of anywhere that uh, uh, a member of the regime appears uh, in, a, in a former public uh, event, there are the voices of Venezuela showing them that uh, wherever they go, uh, uh, the, the truth will be heard. And I would say something that is uh, probably not politically correct, but we need financing. I mean, the resistance in Venezuela, the, 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 what's left of, of um, independent media, basically in the digital sector, uh, union leaders, Student movements need to have support in order to have, you know, these activities to grow uh, inter and the messages to reach beyond the um, very strong censorship and out of censorship that is put in place right now. President Quiroga. Well, um, yeah, thank you. I, I, I second that. I think the Venezuelan diaspora has gotten fairly well organized. And I also know for a fact that whatever Maria Corina and everybody are doing inside of Venezuela must be working well. Because I'll, I'll give you an example. 2015, La Mesa de Unidad Democrática, MUD, was so effective that the government for the election tried to clone the name. I forget the exact, I forget what they called it. It was probably Mafiosos Unidos Delincuentes or something. But, but they cloned the MUD thing and they put it on to confuse the voters. And Soy Venezuela must be very effective because Delcy and the Rodriguez and all those criminals just formed a party. It's called Somos Venezuela, and it's Maduro's new party, again, trying to confuse the people into thinking that that, that is something else. So I think it's, uh, it clearly is working. I think the diaspora, besides what Maria Corina said, uh, and when she mentioned the funding and the financing, everything counts. If you know somebody in Venezuela who's struggling, who's a young university person or who are on the streets, and you can, sell them, uh, you can send them an iPhone X or a Samsung 8 so they can transmit with prepaid chip cards, whatever you can do to help, uh, if, trust me, it works, because the only way out is now, the only way to transmit information, it is, it is this. Imagine if Oscar Perez hadn't had a phone, we probably never would have known what happened to him. I think this is the most helpful tool, and whatever you can do to help him is good. Second, I think the diaspora ought to work on naming and shaming the crooks and their relatives. I don't believe too much in bullying and walking up to them in restaurants and calling them names, 
but just show their beautiful homes, their fancy dancy cars and their yachts and wherever they are and concerted effort everywhere because when we say international community it has to be simultaneous. If you play guacamole and they sell their stuff in Miami and they go to Madrid and then you go to Madrid, they go to Panama, no, it's got to be everybody at the same time with the sanctions, with the seizures, with the expulsions of all the crooks and their relatives and, and everybody else who's doing that and that to be simultaneous. So the diaspora can be very effective at that, naming and shaming uh, uh, these people that are, that are doing all these things. And, and the third and last is push for the establishment or the setup of a global migration uh, program to receive the Venezuelans that are fleeing. Uh, this morning in the, in the early session, I was surprised because you said you went to Cucuta and Mark uh, Schneider mentioned the figures. I, it wasn't even on my radar. See, Mark, we all learned something. I had, I had the figures in Colombia. I know the, the figures in Brazil, in Roraima, in Boavista. But Ecuador, Maria Corina, Mark just said Ecuador. It went from 2,000 to 230,000. Am I quoting you right, Mark? applications yeah. for refugees in a year, and 56,000, did you say, in January 2018. And rule of thumb, the number in Ecuador, you probably have to multiply times five or six to get to the Colombian number, and probably times two or three to get the Brazilian number. Imagine the number, this is larger than Syria, larger than anywhere else. So you need a program, a global, comprehensive, UN, World Bank, well-funded program. Um, if you've ever been to uh, Jordan, I, I have, uh, observed elections, and I'm curious, I went to the Palestinian refugee camps. Now I guess I could go to the Syrian refugee camps. But Colombia, Brazil, you're getting those types of, uh, of problems. And we need massive international help because Colombia cannot handle it, Ecuador cannot handle it, to at least take those people. And then in terms of the diaspora, use what, what the diaspora is doing in Argentina. They got the college degrees for Venezuelans to be recognized by the Argentina government. So if you're a lawyer, you're an architect, you're an engineer, you can go to Argentina and get a job. Oscar Perez, not the one that was summarily executed, but uh, a guy that works with Antonio Ledesma, uh, he, he was exiled in Peru. He's done wonderful work in Peru in terms of getting the people accepted with green cards or temporary residency cards and, and what have you. So you can learn from those examples to try to mobilize all that. And I think the diaspora can be very, very effective. I uh, was talking to, to CNN, and uh, when you say TPS, they go, oh my god, no, it's not going to happen with the current US environment. Well, if you ask the US to take all the Venezuelans, it's not going to happen. But if you ask the Americas to show some reciprocity to the most generous country in the history of the Americas, that was Venezuela, that's where all the Bolivians, Chileans, Argentinians, everybody that was exiled, persecuted, where did they go? What was the little oasis, the heavenly place where you could be, seek, find solace and, and refuge? Venezuela. So just for reciprocity, we ought to have Peru, Argentina, Chile, Paraguay, Uruguay, Mexico, Panama, Colombia, U.S., Spain, be able to temporarily receive these people. Because, and trust me, this is not somebody fleeing Somalia or Sudan that will never come back. Venezuela is the richest, most best endowed country in the world. If you take out the regime, it's got all the possibilities to be a powerhouse again, and everybody will be, ba will be back there with Maria Corina, mm. including Moises Rendon. So use him while you have him, because then he has to go back to Venezuela. <laughs> Thank you, President. Thank you, Ms. Machado. Now we're going to open up for Q&As. Please, we just would like to um, ask you to um, identify yourself, your affiliation, and just go straight to the question, please. Um, so yes, please, down here. Um, make sure to use the microphone since Maria Corina needs to hear you too. Thank you. I'm Timothy Towell, uh, a former U.S. diplomat for 30 years, starting in the Kennedy administration, most of it here in this wonderful hemisphere. Fabulous show. Maria Corina, wonderful things you said. Mr. President, you're always great. And of course, the Secretary General is over doing the Lord's work with the OAS. But my question is, what are those of you, what are those of us who are Yankees? I'm an ex-Yankee imperialist, as you know. What are we gonna do, what do we do? What are we gonna do this afternoon? What are these new diplomats gonna do? What are we gonna do tomorrow? I can't use, I don't know how to use this toy, but my grandson does. But all of us should respond to what the president of Bolivia said. He mentioned sanctions, more sanctions now. Everybody said the same thing, but I heard him say oil. 
why is the great Yankee government and the Yankee Congress do, joining for, on sanctions and doing stuff? Not enough, of course. Why don't they focus on oil? And why doesn't the American people, the Congress, the State Department, the White House, and that president who loves Texas oil men who send money to his election campaign, reportedly, why don't they move on the oil, the Venezuelan oil stuff right now? You said now, Mr. President. Move on it right now and shut that stuff down sure. tomorrow morning. Sure. And all of you go home now and get on your little toys that I can't use. Get 20 of your friends to call the White House. Thank the Secretary of State talks about the Monroe Doctrine, hooray and do other things and do, do it and do it and then do it the next day and tomorrow and the next day after that. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Please, let's grab one or, more, uh, one or two more questions just to save time. Yes, down here, please. Um, hello, I'm Melissa Medina from the Washington office on Latin America. And my question was actually if uh, Mrs. Corina or uh, Mr. Quiroga see any ways for um, measures for a transition uh, for a transitional justice in Venezuela. What would be your ideas for uh, some off ramps from this regime? Great. Let's start with those two questions, please, Mr. President, Ms. Machado. Okay, let's start, Ms. Machado. Well, uh, regarding. Um, Transitional justice, we're certainly going to to move into perhaps one of the most critical if areas because if uh, something Venezuelans need in order to move ahead uh, is, is justice. Uh, but at the same time, we certainly need to give today incentives for those who are afraid or still holding to, to, to the regime to take a step forward. So uh, there are, as you surely know, Melissa, uh, uh, good examples and experiences from which we are uh, now starting and learning in, in terms of steps to take. Uh, I don't think it is uh, the opportunity to necessarily, um, you know, explicitly uh, say the scope of, of those uh, um, actions. But, uh, but certainly the incentives uh, should be given clearly for either, for both military and civilians close to the re regime right now. Uh, if you ask me, one of the most important elements and pillars of, of the reforms Venezuela had to move ahead is precisely what we call un pacto para la justicia. Uh, and, 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 and that will be one of the biggest challenges in terms of the whole system that should be re, re, rebuilt. And regarding um, the, the, the first question, uh, I, I certainly hope that the U.S. society maintains a strong position uh, towards um, the U.S. authorities that have decided to move ahead. It is clear that, that this uh, decision has been taken uh, because it is seen, Venezuela has been seen as a clear and present danger for the stability and security of the hemisphere, and I, I certainly agree with that. Uh, regarding the, the sanctions on oil, I, I do have a different uh, opinion. I, I believe uh, actually that is not, uh, not necessary. Uh, I, I think there are other uh, initiatives uh, regarding uh, the sources, the financial sources that the regime and the corrupt uh, sources the regime is using that could be more effective. And I think that the sanctions that have been put in place, the financial sector sanctions that have been placed, have been very effective in that uh, in that sense. Mr. President, any any uh, thoughts? No, just just a couple quick addition. I think on. Uh, transitional justice, yeah, it has to be put on the table, and I would suggest the following. Uh, no vengeance, no impunity, but justice. Because many times transitional justice gets used as a euphemism to disguise pure and outright impunity. And I think what the Venezuelan people will want in the end is justice. They don't want vengeance, they don't want people to be hanged on public squares. No impunity, uh, no vengeance, but justice uh, for, for the transition. Um, 
And in terms of uh, the package, I think I'm not going to repeat myself, but I think what is of the essence of the next 58 days is simultaneous, coordinated, international action. Uh, since I am not a foreign minister, I don't have to watch what I say. I don't have to get along with everybody. I push the envelope. I ask for the whole menu. I, I, the CSIS mode, apply the charter, put the seizures, uh, put the sanctions, uh, take out the stuff, expel them, uh, break relations. Or something. I mean, I, if you give me a part of that, it's good enough. But I, I'll, so, so long as I can, I'll push for the eight things because I have found out that the diplomatic dynamics move a heck of a lot slower than the ruthless authoritarians do. And, and they are so creative at keeping, they always keep pushing the envelope. I mean, if you just look at the, cool. uh, the last dialogue, they said, okay, no, we're going to discuss electoral conditions for presidential elections. And now here we have, they disbar parties, they disbar people that can run. Now it's going to be presidential, now it's going to be regional, now it's going to be local. Is they, they're going to elect Miss Venezuela, the MVP of the baseball. Everything is going to be elected on April 22nd now because they moved everything. So my only fear is that the diplomacy takes too long and it's a little too slow and my only admonition would be regarding everything that can be done including what you do with the oil funding has to be put on the table now because life has taught us if you let this slip and slide and they set up a second Cuba in the end a few months down the road some country will say well that's a reality we can't do anything and let's recognize them and let's get along and let's go along and we and, and, and I speak also from personal interest if on April 19th they, they do the transition from Raul Castro to Diaz Canel, and here comes Cuba for, forever with a new generation, and if Maduro entrenches himself in power and sets up a second Cuba, the third one is coming to Bolivia. <laughs> I know that for a fact. And next year you probably have to send me uh, cards in jail when I'm in, in Bolivia. So I, I, I'm deeply interested in, in what is happening because I think it is a time now for all of Venezuela, uh, for Venezuela to get all the help that we can now. Diplomatic cycles and dynamics move a little bit slow. And the last point I'll, I'll, I'll make on this. I think we have to do this in a coordinated, integrated fashion and also with some consistency. I, the Secretary General said he salutes the fact that uh, Venezuela, uh, Venezuela was disinvited. Maduro was disinvited from, uh, from going to Peru, which begs the question, why is Cuba invited? If Maduro is on his way to setting up a second Cuba and he gets disinvited because he's trying, what about the ones that just did it? And by the way, five days after the summit, they are going to have a completely undemocratic transition where the baton is going to be passed from one person to the other one, hand-picked, hand-chosen, without any democracy. So I think the coordinated, integrated international effort needs to also have consistency because that's what gets questioned. You're inconsistent. You're doing one thing here, you're doing another thing there. And to keep the, the coordination with consistency is critical. Thank you. And we only have about 60 days left to do something, so it needs to come soon. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, down here, please. Stand up. Hi, uh, my name is Jamie Dorner. I've been in DC for about eight years, but I'm originally from New Jersey, so like a Yankee. Um, I, President Quiroga, with all due respect, I agree with what you say, but I do want to challenge you a little bit on that two ways. Maduro has never really expressed any sort of concern about being expelled from Mercosur or, you know, he's been head to head with um, Almagro for so long that why would it matter to him if he wasn't allowed to go to Peru for the summit? You know, what difference would that make? And also on the notion of Cuba, we have seen that over 50, 60 years of just the U.S. turning their back and the U.S. not acting quite well towards Cuba, we have seen that that doesn't exactly work. So the opportunity to open the dialogue, I think, gets us further than just turning our back altogether like we are doing to Venezuela right now. Let's grab another question, please, over there on the back. Yeah, the woman. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Laura Natera. I work for the Inter-American Bank of Development. Well, first of all, um, as a Venezuelan and a woman, I um, want to thank uh, CSIS for organizing this event with Maria Corina. Maria Corina, um, as a Venezuelan, I'm very grateful for all the efforts that you have been doing for our community. Like, is I'm very grateful. 
Um, my question would be, obviously we have mentioned how important it is to place sanctions and how important financing is at this moment, but obviously the situation there right now needs, we need medical, uh, um, medical resources, we need food. So Maria Corina, from your perspective, what would be right now the best way and most effective way to send food and medicine to Venezuela? Because we all know that people that are striking and that are going to protests and that are fighting for this, if they, are, if they don't have food and they don't have medicines, well, they are gonna die anyway. So we like, what is the best way to provide this kind of help? And thank you. Thank you. Well, we have two questions, one for each. Um, Mr. President, you would like to start with the first one? Sure. Um, yes, I, uh, I understand the question on what Maduro cares or doesn't. Trust me, take my word for it, they do care deeply about being shamed or kicked, kicked out of international organizations. Why? Because if you remember what Maria Corina laid out, the regime's power was based on money, votes, international support, mafias, and military. I think I'm using all five. Their international support was something like we'd never seen before. I, I can tell you for a fact. At the heyday of oil power, we had the combination of a charismatic, good communicator leader that destroyed the economy, Mr. Chavez, but he was a great communicator, a powerful combination of CNN, MTV, History Channel, Comedy Central, speaking for hours, and he ran the hemisphere with $140 uh, price of barrel. He bought the, he bought the Americas. He funded the, he funded the campaigns. He had control of the OAS. Before we had our hero Almagro, we had we had a very um, the OAS was very um, insulsa, uh, with, with a, uh, it, it was non-existent. And he had 22 or 30 vo 34 votes at the OAS. He controlled it, he ran, he ran it. He protected his cronies, Evo Morales, Correa, and everybody else at the Comisión de Derechos Humanos, at the Corte de San Jose. It was a project based on regional hegemony. He was the leader of the Americas, which with all due respect to Venezuela, Bolivia, Honduras, the leader of the hemisphere should be Brazil, Mexico, perhaps Argentina, but he ran the show. In 2003, he put in power a couple in Argentina, the Kirchner PT in Brazil, he ran the whole thing. He put all the governments in place, and he ran that place. And now, when, he, when the backlash started, they, they changed the leaders, and clearly uh, Maduro doesn't have the talents of Mr. Chavez. I mean, if you really want to needle him, I do, this, I do this in Caracas. I say they're different because Chavez used to explain, get applause, touch hearts, get tears, tell you jokes, make you laugh. Maduro, he explains, he makes you laugh. Uh, the tears are when you go to the market and you can't find food or you can't find medicine and the applause will be reserved for, for, for the day he's on a plane to, to The Hague. I think that's so, so different types of leadership. The price of oil went down, but by the way, there's a myth that the cause of this is the decline of oil price. No, you just heard Maria Corina. A country that used to produce 3.3, 3.5 million barrels of oil a day is gonna wind up this year with 1.3 million barrels of oil a day. They destroyed everything. All private means of production, including oil that was run by the state. They have destroyed it. But at the heyday of their power, they controlled international organizations. And they do care about this so much that when it was being discussed, uh, the medical suit uh, uh, expulsion was being discussed. Delcy Rodriguez, wild and crazy, went to Buenos Aires and tried to crash, like the wedding crashers, the, the, the party. So they, they do worry about that. And trust me, in Cancun, at the OIS, when they were voting the resolution, they moved heaven and earth to stop us from getting two-thirds for the resolution. So every little bit counts, because if the, if the reading inside of Venezuela is that the international community doesn't really mind that you're shooting Oscar Perez, that you're disbarring people, that you have 350 political prisoners, that Leopoldo Lopez is still under house arrest, that Daniel Ceballos has been mistreated in jail, and you can go to the Democratic Club and get along, then the message would be that that is tolerable. So you have to show that there's intolerance to these types of things. And the second on, on, on Cuba, yes, I, I w I'm never for embargoes. I got kicked out of events in Miami when I said I was opposed to the embargo. I believe in freedom. I don't believe uh, the country, this, this country used to uh, stand for the Berlin airlift, not for walls. Well, I don't know about now, but it used to not stand for walls, but this is the country that tore down the Berlin Wall. And I believe you, you fight this best with freedom. But I think in Cuba, you have to lift the embargo from without and the democratic embargo from within. And that's what's lacking. No one speaks up. No one speaks up to help out Rosa Maria Paya and the people in, in Cuba to lift the democratic embargo within Cuba. 
All the attention is on the U.S. embargo, 99%. But where, is, where are the voices clamoring for the democratic freedoms to be restored in Cuba? April 19th, they set the date. It was in February. They delayed it. It's no coincidence. Right after the America summit, if you ask me, little prediction, their campaign closings for the transition in Cuba and Maduro are going to be a show at some coliseum in Lima with some left-wing people over there saying we're going to go take on the U.S. Watch out. And you may have, I tweeted this, Maduro may get on Evo Morales' plane to go to Lima and try to crash that party. Maybe not the summit, but try to do something like that. They do care about that. I'll, I'll close with this in terms of Venezuela, Cuba. April 19, Cuba. April 22nd, Venezuela. Uh, May 27, and then Ju uh, June 17th. Colombia, the Caribbean Triangle. And I'll say this very respectfully, but there was a huge mistake that was made by the previous U.S. administration and the Pope. I don't want to have my visa taken away. I don't want to be excommunicated or communion uh, taken away from me on, <laughs> on Sunday. But what was the thing? So you can understand. And I said this on December 2015. I'll, I'll say it again. There was a deal, a quid pro quo between Obama and the Nobel Peace Prize and all those lofty efforts, and the Pope that said the Caribbean Triangle, this was the strategy. What matters is the opening to Cuba after 50 years, worthy goal, theoretically. Peace in Colombia after 50 years, extremely worthy goal, theoretically. But those two needed a condition to look the other way when it came to the defense of Venezuelan democracy for a simple reason. Cuba was only propped up by the barrels of oil that were flowing from Venezuela to Cuba. And you can only negotiate with the FARC terrorists so long as they had a place to stash their guns and their coke and their, do their drug dealings in Venezuela. So to me, it was, yes, geo, real politic. I understand. I get it. The two worthy uh, efforts were opening in Cuba, peace in Colombia after 50 years at the expense and the price they were willing to pay is let's look the other way in Venezuela. And here we are. And we're about Please to wind up with neither or neither or neither. We're about to lose the, the whole ship. Tell me about the opening of Cuba. What has changed? Nothing. April 19th, they're still going to go after that. And I think what we have had is the destruction of, uh, of, um, of Venezuela, a peace process that, that is under questioning in Colombia. So my only, my only question is, my only point on this would be, if you think, uh, whatever you may think about this, understand between April, May, and June, the Caribbean Triangle is going to be rejiggered. Venezuela, Colombia, and Cuba. And the crux of the matter is in Venezuela. And the only way you can have a true opening and democratic opening to Cuba, the only way you'll have sustainable peace in Colombia is if we're able to restore democracy in Venezuela. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, President. Uh, Ms. Machado, you have any thoughts that you want to add to the discussion? Uh, absolutely. But, but I'll start answering to Laura uh, Moises. First, I want to say I, I also am very proud of uh, our diaspora and, and grateful for the way you have organized and be so effective. And the hardest and most important decisive days are ahead of us. Laura, there are many NGOs that are doing uncovered work because in order to bring food and medicine because the regime persecutes them. So uh, I think I'd prefer to let you know some of these initiatives through Moises, and then we'll make sure a lot of uh, people that want to help can, can have uh, their coordinates. Uh, but that's certainly not in the scale, and will not be in the scale that Venezuela will need it. Look, we've seen 500, 1 million, 500,000 to 1 million Venezuelans leave recently. Imagine if that increases to four, five, or six million. That is the magnitude of the threat and the risk we are facing. So I, I do want to insist in what uh, Tuto mentioned regarding urgency. This is a regime that has totally discounted the cost of fraud and the cost of repression. And we're certainly facing the most dangerous days in our fight. Um, I, if I'm honest to you, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to speak like this again in the near future. I, I, I don't know if, if this afternoon or tomorrow they will see some of us, silence the rest of us. So it is urgent what, what's taking place. And uh, regarding this regional project, I have to insist 
Venezuela's territory and resources. And this nar narco dictatorship is being used to finance uh, similar political projects in the region, in Colombia, in Mexico, in Brazil, and other places. So this is certainly uh, in the highest, utmost priority, not only for Venezuelans, because it is a matter of life or death. Uh, the, every day that Maduro stays in power cannot be counted anymore in hours, but in deaths. Venezuelans that are killed with arms and hunger. Uh, but at the same time, it is a growing uh, um, threat for the whole region. And this window of opportunity that I said is clear, but could be could close soon. Cannot we have we cannot be left past. We have to take advantage and do what we ought to do, which at this point is pretty clear. It's courage, it's work organization and cooperation and communication among the, 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 the leaders abroad and the leaders inside that are determined to, to save Venezuela and bring back and, and rebuild the nation of prosperity, justice, peace and, and freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um Thank you. And with those powerful words for action, we're going to end the session. Thank you so much for joining today at CSIS. Please join me again to thank President Quiroga, Ms. Machado, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Tuto. Thank you all.